This evening we commemorate the beheading of the prophet forerunner of the Lord, John the Baptist. The evangelists Matthew and Mark provide accounts about the martyric end of John the Baptist in the year 32 after the birth of Christ. Following the baptism of the Lord, St. John the Baptist was locked up in prison by Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch, ruler of one-fourth of the Holy Land, and governor of Galilee. After the death of King Herod the Great, the Romans divided the territory of Palestine into four parts and put a governor in charge of each part. Herod Antipas received Galilee from the Emperor Augustus. The prophet of God, John, openly denounced Herod for having left his lawful wife, the daughter of the Arabian king, Eratos, and then instead cohabiting with Herodias, the wife of his brother, Philip. On his birthday, Herod made a feast for dignitaries, the elders, and a thousand chief citizens. Salome, the daughter of Herodias danced before the guests and charmed Herod. In gratitude to the girl, he swore to her to give her whatever she would ask, up to half his kingdom. The vile girl, on the advice of her wicked mother Herodias, asked that she be given the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Herod became apprehensive. For he feared the wrath of God for the murder of a prophet, whom earlier he had heeded. He also feared the people who loved the holy forerunner. But because of the guests and his careless oath, he gave orders to cut off the head of St. John and to give it to Salome. According to tradition, the mouth of the dead preacher of repentance once more opened and proclaimed, Herod, you should not have the wife of your brother Philip. Salome took the platter with the head of St. John and gave it to her mother. The frenzied Herodias repeatedly stabbed the tongue of the prophet with a needle and buried his holy head in an unclean place. But the pious Joanna, wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, buried the head of John the Baptist in an earthen vessel on the Mount of Olives, where Herod had a parcel of lamb. The holy body of John the Baptist was taken that night by his disciples and buried at Sebastia, there where the wicked deed had been done. After the murder of St. John the Baptist, Herod continued to govern for a certain time. Pontius Pilate, governor of Judea, later sent Jesus Christ to him, whom he mocked. The judgment of God came upon Herod, Herodias, and Salome, even during their earthly life. Salome, crossing the river Sicoris in winter, fell through the ice. The ice gave way in such a way that her body was in the water, but her head was trapped above the ice was similar to how she once had danced with her feet upon the ground, but now she flailed helplessly in the icy water. Thus she was trapped until that time when the sharp ice cut through her neck. Her corpse was not found, but they brought the head to Herod and Herodias as once they had brought them the head of St. John the Baptist. Arab king Eratos, in revenge for the disrespect shown his daughter, made war against Herod. The defeated Herod suffered the wrath of the Roman emperor Caius Caligula and was exiled with Herodias first to Gaul and then to Spain. The beheading of St. John the Baptist, a 
knife or eat food that is round in shape on this day. Today the church makes remembrance of Orthodox soldiers killed on the field of battle as established in 1769 at the time of Russia's war with the Turks and the Poles. We also commemorate this evening Saints Alexander, John, and Paul, who were patriarchs of Constantinople. They lived at different times, but each of them happened to clash with the activities of heretics who sought to distort the teachings of the church. Saint Alexander, who was arch who patriarch from 325 to 340, was a vicar bishop during the time of Saint Metrophanes, the first patriarch of Constantinople. Because of the patriarch's extreme age, Alexander submitted for him at the first ecumenical synod, or the first ecumenical council at Nicaea in 325. Upon his death, Saint Metrophanes left instructions in his will to elect his vicar to the throne of Constantinople. During these times, His Holiness, Patriarch Alexander, had to contend with the Arians and with pagans. Once in a dispute with a pagan philosopher, the saint said to him, In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, I command you to be quiet. <laughs> and the pagan suddenly became mute. When he gestured with signs to acknowledge his errors and affirm the correctness of the Christian teaching, then his speech returned to him, and he believed in Christ together with many other pagan philosophers. The faithful rejoiced at this, glorifying God, who had given such power to his saint. The heretic Arius was punished through the prayer of St. Alexander. Arius had apparently agreed to enter into communion with the Orthodox. When the emperor asked him if he believed as the fathers of Nicaea taught, he placed his hand upon his breast, where he had cunningly concealed beneath his clothes a document with his own false creed written upon it, and said, This is what I believe. St. Constantine, unaware of the deceitful wickedness of Arius, set a day for receiving him into the church. All night long, St. Alexander prayed, imploring the Lord not to permit this heretic to be received into communion with the church. In the morning, Arius set out triumphantly for the church, surrounded by his imperial counselors and soldiers, but divine judgment overtook him. Stopping to take care of a physical necessity, his bowels burst forth, and he perished in his own blood and filth, as did Judas. His holiness, patriarch Alexander, having toiled much, died in the year 340 at the age of 98. St. John IV, the faster, was patriarch of Constantinople from 582 to 595, is famed with the Orthodox Church as the compiler of a penitential nomo canon, or rules of penances, which has come down to us in several distinct versions, but their foundation is one and the same. These are instructions for priests on how to hear the confession of secret sins, whether these sins have been committed or are merely sins of intention. Ancient church rules address the manner and duration of public penances, which were established for obvious and manifest sinners. But it was necessary to adapt these rules for the secret confession of things which were not evident. St. John the Faster issued his penitential normal canon so that the confession of secret sins unknown to the world bore witness to the good disposition of the sinner and of his conscience in being reconciled to God. And so the saint reduced the penances of the ancient fathers by half or more. On the other hand, he set more exactly the character of the penances, severe fasting, daily performance of a set number of prostrations to the ground, 
the distribution of alms, etc. The length of penance is determined by the priest. The main purpose of the Nomo Canon, compiled by the Holy Patriarch, consists in assigning penances, not simply according to the consciousness of the sins, or the seriousness of the sins, but according to the degree of repentance and the spiritual state of the person who confesses. Among the Greeks and later in the Russian church, the rulers of St. John the Faster are honored on a level with other saintly rules, and the normal canons of his book are accounted except the applicable for all the Orthodox Church. St. Paul, the third of our patriarchs commemorated this evening, by birth was a Cypriot. He became Patriarch of Constantinople in 780 to 784, during the reign of the iconoclast Emperor Leo IV, and was a virtuous and pious but timid man. Seeing the martyrdom which the Orthodox endured for the holy icons, the saint concealed his orthodoxy and associated with the iconoclasts. After the death of the Emperor Leo, he wanted to restore icon veneration, but was not able to accomplish this since the iconoclasts were still quite powerful. The saint realized that it was not in his power to guide the flock, and so he left the patriarchal throne and went secretly to the monastery of St. Forest, where he took the skimma, which is an oath to be a monk. He repented in his silence and association with the iconoclast and spoke of the necessity for convening the seventh ecumenical council to condemn the iconoclast heresy. Upon his advice, St. Tarasius was chosen to the patriarchal throne, to the patriarchal throne. At that time, he was prominent, prominent emperor, imperial counselor. The saint died as a schema monk in the year 804. Our last commemoration this evening is St. Aidan, Bishop of Lindisfarne. St. Aidan, a steadfast defender of Celtic practices against the imposition of Roman usage, was born in Ireland, then called Scotland in the 7th century. As a monk of the monastery founded by St. Columba on the island of I Iona, he was known for his strict asceticism. When the Holy King Oswald of North Northumbria wanted to convert his people to Christianity, he turned to the Celtic monks of Iona rather than the Roman clergy at Canterbury. The first bishop sent to lead the mission proved unsuitable, for he alienated many people by his harshness, and he blamed the hostile disposition of the English for his failure. St. Aidan said that the bishop was to blame and not the English. Instead of being very severe with an ignorant people, he should have fed them with milk rather than solid food as found in 1 Corinthians 3.2. The bishop was recalled, and an ideal candidate was found to replace him. St. Aidan was consecrated bishop and sent to Northumbria to take charge of the mission. King Oswald gave him the island of Lindisfarne near the royal residence of Bomberg for his Episcopal see. St. Aidan also founded the famous monastery on Lindus Farm in 635. St. Bede, in his Ecclesiastical History of the English People, praises Aidan for his humility and piety, recommending him as a model for other bishops and priests to follow. He was not attached to the things of this world, nor did he seek earthly treasures. Whenever he received gifts from the king or from rich men, he distributed them to the poor. On Wednesdays and Fridays, he would fast from all food until the ninth hour, which is about 3 p.m., except during the Paschal season. 
From Linda's farm, St. Aidan traveled all over Northumbria, visiting his flock and establishing missions. St. Oswald, who knew Galaic from the time he and his family were exiled to Iona, acted as an interpreter for Bishop Aidan, who did not speak English. Thus the king played an active role in the conversion of his people. One year after attending the services of Pascha, King Oswald sat down to a meal with Bishop Aidan. Just as the bishop was about to bless the food, a servant came and informed the king that a great number of needy folk were outside begging for alms. The king ordered that his own food be served to the poor on silver platters, and that the silver serving dishes be broken up and distributed to them. There is a charming illustration of this incident in the 13th century Verthold Missal in New York's Piermont Morgan Library. Aidan, deeply moved by St. Oswald's charity, took him by the right hand and said, May this hand never perish. According to tradition, St. Oswald's hand remained incorrupt for centuries after his death. St. Bede says that the head was kept in the church of St. Peter at Bomberg, but it was venerated by all, where it was venerated by all. The present location of the hand, if it still survives, is not known. St. Oswald was killed in battle against the superior forces of King Penda on August 5th of 642 at a place called Masterfield. He was only 38 years old. St. Aidan was deeply grieved by the king's death, but his successor, St. Oswin, was also very dear to him. <clears throat> king Oswin once gave St. Aidan a horse and a cart for his journeys, because the bishop usually traveled on foot. Soon after this, Bishop Aidan met a beggar and gave him the horse and cart. The king heard of this and was disturbed by it. He asked St. Aidan why he had given the royal gift away where there were ordinary horses in the stables which were more suitable for a beggar. Aidan rebuked him, asking if the king regarded the foal of a mare more highly than the Son of God. At first he did not understand. Then he fell at the bishop's feet, weeping tears of repentance. Asking for forgiveness, Oswin promised never again to judge St. Aidan's charitable deeds. <clears throat> St. Aidan raised the king to his feet, declaring that he had never seen a king who was so humble. He prophesied that Oswin would soon depart from this life since the people did not deserve such a ruler. His prophecy was soon fulfilled for St. Oswin was murdered at Gilling on August 20, 651. St. Aidan departed to the Lord on August 31st, less than two weeks later. He died at Bomberg <coughs> by the west wall of the church. The beam on which he was leaning to support himself still survives, even though the church was twice destroyed by fire. The beam may still be seen in the ceiling of the present church above the baptismal font. On the day St. Aidan died, St. Cuthbert was a young man tending his master's sheep. Looking up, Cuthbert saw a vision of angels bearing someone's soul to heaven in a sphere of fire. Later he learned that Bishop Aidan had died at that very hour that he had seen the vision. At first, the Holy Bishop Aidan was buried at Linda's farm on the right side of the altar in the Church of St. Peter. In 664, the Synod at Whitby declared that all the churches of Britain must follow Roman practices and that Celtic customs were to be suppressed. St. Coleman, the third bishop of Linda's farm, was unable to accept this decision Therefore, he decided to retire to Iona, taking the bones of St. Aidan with him. Celtic
Baltic customs survived in Iona until the 8th century. Glory to God for all things. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Thou say, O Lord, keep us this evening without sin. Blessed art thou, O Lord, the God of our fathers, and praise and glorify is thy name forever. Amen. Let thy mercy be upon us, O Lord, even as we have set our hope. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Blessed art thou, O Master, make me to understand thy statutes. Blessed art thou, O Holy One, enlighten me with thy statutes. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. O despise not the works of thy hands. To thee belongeth worship, to thee belongeth praise. To thee belongeth glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Now and ever.
us how to build up each other for the work of ministry. Help us to use the talents and abilities you have given each of us for the well-being of your church. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that our hearts may be aflame with love for you. Enable us to structure our lives and our community that your love and mercy may more effectively be shown in the world. Inspire us as we gather in community to worship you. In our daily lives, help us to maintain our fellowship for the building up of ourselves and our community. For you are a merciful God who loves mankind, and to you we send up glory. To your Father, who is without beginning, and your all holy good and life giving spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. O God Almighty, Lord of heaven and earth, and of all creation, visible and invisible, in thy ineffable goodness look down upon us, thy people gathered in thy holy name. Be our helper and defender in this day of affliction. Thou knowest our weakness, thou hearest our cry and repentance and contrition of heart. O Lord, who lovest mankind, deliver us from the threat of this coronavirus. Send thine angel to watch over us and protect us. Grant health and recovery to those suffering from this virus. Guide the hands of physicians and health care providers and preserve those who are healthy. Enable us to continue to serve our suffering brothers and sisters in peace, that together we may glorify thy most honorable and majestic name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Confirm, O God, the holy Orthodox faith and Orthodox Christians, unto ages of ages. Most holy Theotokos, save us. Christ our God, have mercy on